some cool protein that you want to study, so you want to get cells to make it for you. First of all, how are you going to find the instructions for making them? And second of all, where are you going to put them? There are lots of different options when it comes to plasmid vectors, which are these circular pieces of DNA that we can stick the instructions for making a protein and stick this into bacteria and get bacteria to make a lot of it for us. There are also vect plasmid vectors for other sorts of cells expression. Um, so today I want to talk about more about these vectors and how we choose them um, and also where we can find the instructions for making a protein we want to study. Okay, so I have more background in other posts if people are interested. Um, today I want to go really in depth into some of the features of various plasmids um, that you would want to keep in mind. Um, and so just a quick background so we're all on the same page. We have the instructions for making a protein are going to be written in DNA in the form of genes. Um, and this DNA, there's going to be a messenger RNA copy of it made. So an RNA copy of this gene gets made. Um, and then this RNA copy, this messenger RNA is used by these ribosomes, these protein making complexes to um, follow the instructions of the messenger RNA to make the corresponding protein. This messenger RNA is a little bit of a complication when it comes to the, tech, the terminology that we use because this messenger RNA is actually an edited form of the gene. The gene has these regions called introns, which have um, regulatory information that don't have the instructions for making the protein. So the instructions for making the protein are in the parts called exons, and the introns get removed in a process called splicing, and this gives you the mature messenger RNA. Let's talk about in some other posts, this can actually, you can splice in different ways, alternative splicing, and get different CD and different products, um, different messenger RNA products. When we want to stick the instructions into a vector, into this vehicle that's going to let us get it into cells, when we do this, we're going to want to put in DNA because this plasmid vector is going to be DNA. So we need to put in a DNA version of this RNA, and we call this a complementary DNA or a cDNA. So it's going to be the cDNA that we're putting in, not the actual like gene, but we typically often just refer to it as the gene, but it is the cDNA. Sometimes you might see the term ORF. ORF, open reading frame. Um, so this is also going to be a term that you might see, which refers to which frame that the reading is going to occur for in um, because of the different um, reading frames of the DNA. And so the open reading frame that you want is going to be, be the one that like starts with a so you have like your ATG typically, um, or an AUG in the messenger RNA, and then the, the protein instructions. Um, and so sometimes you might see like ORFs um, in terms of like the inserts that you're putting in. So the plasma that you're putting into, we'll get way in depth into some of the features. Um, but there, there are different things about the plasma that it's going to have. It's going to have an origin of replication. And as we'll talk about, these can be like high copy number or low copy number. This is where the DNA polymerase is going to latch on and make copies of this plasmid. So this plasmid is going to be hosted in the cell apart from the cell's own DNA. So the cell will have its own genomic DNA as well as this plasmid that you're going to put into these cells. Um, and both will need to get copied, and so it's going to have an origin of replication so that it can get copied. It's also going to have some sort of selection marker, such as an antibiotic resistance selection marker, and this way that only cells that have, the, have taken in the plasmid will be able to grow, and you can use this to select for them. We'll get more into each of these things in detail. In front of your gene your, or your insert, your cDNA, um, you're going to have a promoter. This is going to tell the RNA polymerase, so the one that is going to make this copy of this messenger RNA copy from the DNA, is going to tell it to make the copy. And then, um, in, so in bacteria, this is actually like coupled. So when you have transcription happen, now you have translation happen um, concurrently because the processes aren't separated like they are in our cells. So these are some different key features of plasmids. And then we'll look at how these can differ between different plasmids and how we might want to choose one or the other. If you're interested in how we actually go about getting the 
DNA, I'll go into more detail about how you can actually get the get the insert that you want to put in. There are depositories like AdGene and DNASU that we'll look at that actually host a lot of different plasmids um, with the instructions for making different proteins. Um, so either ones that people have studied before and then they've like done papers on them and deposited them, or you can find ones that they, no one's really studied that much, but they have these giant libraries of all the cDNAs for these different proteins. And so we'll look at more of that later. Once we have one of those, we can then clone them into a different cell um, that we would like better. So even if we get a cDNA that comes in one plasmid, that doesn't mean that we actually, that we're restricted to using it in that other plasmid. In fact, a lot of times you'll get a plasmid that's going to come in a, um, it's going to come in a vector that you don't want. Uh, it might even come in a vector that's totally incompatible with what you want. Maybe it's a mammalian cell expression vector and you want to express it in bacteria. And so you can then subclone it. So move it out of one clone into another. There are different methods for doing this, including restriction cutting, cloning, where you're basically cutting around the insert. I'll also show you these vectors often have restriction cut sites around them to make this easier, as well as PCR-based methods like SWIP, which is what I typically used. Um, there are also other like overhang-based methods, and sometimes the plasmids that things come in are like gateway plasmids or that sort of thing where they're designed to have easier cloning between, uh, between different plasmids. But traditionally it's been restriction cloning um, until PCR-based methods really took over and that sort of thing. Okay, so when it comes to plasmids, the, it can be really overwhelming. So this is just from GenScript's website. They have this giant list of their vectors. And so you can see the ORF clone, so the open reading frame. Um, and so I will warn you though, that they're probably going to be a lot more expensive um, than if you were to find it, say at DNASU or at Gene, and then just clone it into the vector that you want. Um, and so hopefully this post will help you understand how you can do that more easily. But you'll see that there's going to be vectors for mammalian cells, bacteria cells, um, yeast cells, baculovirus cells, so like insect cell expression, as I've talked about before. And they're going to have all of these different features that we'll get into, things like tags, selection markers, different promoters. When you are looking for a plasmid in, say, adgene or DS, DNA SU, often these are going to be, um, sometimes these might be plasmids, especially with adgene, there'll be plasmids that people have done a paper on, um, done used in a paper. And so this is a paper that they actually use to express this protein, which can be a good thing because then you don't need to worry about cloning it into an expression, um, like a vector for your own expression. Um, and because you know that it probably works and you don't have to optimize it too much. But if it's also um, one of the ones that's more less studied and that sort of thing, there will often be in some sort of just generic donor vector um, that we'll talk about. Um, and so you'll see when you search for a different protein, you'll see a bunch of different things come up and in various different plasmids, depending on how much people have studied this thing, um, they might have a, in a lot of different plasmids, or if it's something that people haven't studied very much, then it's likely to just be in one or two plasmids, um, often just one. Um, and it's just going to be a plasmid that's going to be good for cloning and not for expression. So let's talk more about the sort of differences between vectors that you might want to use for various purposes. So when it comes to comparing vector plasmids, here are some of the key things that, to look for. So remember, like this looks really overwhelming. There's all of these different things. And even if we look, just look at pet vectors, which is the system um, of expression from this T7 promoter. And this is one of probably the most commonly used um, expression vector for bacterial expression. Um, and you can see that even within this pet series, there's all these different things, uh, but these really just differ in um, some really simple things that we're going to get into. And a lot of times, especially if you're using a PCR based method, it doesn't really matter which of these, um, which of these your plasmid is in. Um, okay. 
So we're going to talk about these things now. So the copy number. So copy number refers to how many copies of the plasma that the cell can host. So remember that the cell has its own genomic DNA and then it's also holding copies of your plasmid. Some plasmids have what we call a high copy number, which means that there are lots of copies of them hosted in the cell, whereas others have a low copy number, which means there aren't very many. Often these low copy number plasmids are low copy number because they're under um, the control of the bacterial replication machinery um, and the bacterial replication proteins. So they're going to be dependent on those and therefore they're going to um, only replicate like when the bacteria is. And so then they're going to have a lower copy number. And you might think um, that this is a bad thing and it would be a bad thing if all you were caring about was cloning. So all of you were caring about was making lots and lots of copies of this DNA. Then it would be important to have a high copy number. But if then you subsequently want to get the, um, get the cell to make protein from that, if you give them too many copies of the recipe, now they're going to maybe get sloppy, they're going to be rushing, they're going to run out of supplies and get depleted and you'll have problems, you might even have like buildup of toxic proteins inside the cell, so this can be a bad thing. Um, so typically a lower copy number would be better for protein expression and a higher copy number would be better for just doing cloning and that sort of thing. Um, if you wanna make a lot of DNA, various things like that. Um, so there are, this, this is the, going to depend on that origin of replication. Um, so AdGene has some really great resources. They have this um, Plasmid 101, blog and um, guide that I highly recommend. Uh, here you can see that they have a description of some of the common vectors and the various copy numbers. So some of the high copy number ones would be like your PUC vectors, your blue script, your PGEM. Uh, these have from between around 500 copies per cell. Whereas the ones that we use for expression, such as this pet vector, PGEX, um, PBR322, which is actually like the parent of these two, these are going to have a lower copy number around 15 to 20. You can also see that some of these have, there's like these incompatibility groups. So sometimes you might want to put multiple plasmids inside of cells and you need to make sure that their origins are, are compatible with one another. Um, you don't want to put the one, in ones that are in the same like incompatibility group. So if they're using like the same machinery, you don't wanna put in two plasmids that are using that same machinery, then they're gonna be competing, they're gonna be depleting the machinery, you're gonna have problems. Um, so you wanna use ones from different groups. Okay, so that was the copy number. And now let's talk about the promoter usage. So when we talk about the promoter usage, now we're talking about this section. So you can see that in these PCDNA clones that were from mammalian cells, these are under this promoter called CMB. We're not gonna talk about mammalian cell expression here, except to note that these plasmids, these PCDNA three point somethings, those are gonna be mammalian um, and CMB. And so you, when you're looking in like adgene or DNASU, when you see one of those, it's going to be a mammalian expression vector. But remember that you can always just subclone it out of that vector and into a vector for bacterial expression, et cetera. You might also see sometimes the, the vectors that are used are for like transient expression, some are for permanent expression, some are for various um, things, some have things added on like GFP. But remember, you can always subclone out and into whatever you want. Especially with PCR-based methods, this can be very simple and you can do it from anything to anything. Okay, but for bacteria, now we're looking at, for our promoters, we're looking at things like T7, T7 and LAC, and this is going to be T5, um, which uses the RNA, uh, the E. coli RNA. Um, these like PQE, these are going to use the E. coli RNA polymerase. There's also like this TAC promoter. So this is a hybrid between the TRIP and LAC operons. It is capable of, the inducible expression. Um, so you add IPKG just like you would in your T7 and LAC ones. But in this case, it's going to use the bacteria's own um, RNA polymerase. And so it's a hybrid from these bacteria's own 
gene's own promoters. And so it's going to use the E. coli's own RNA polymerase, but it's going to have that IPTG injectabil inductability. But because you don't need the T7, so you don't have to have special cells that have the T7, but that also means that you don't get that extra level of control. So you're gonna get some more leakiness of the expression. So it's not good if you, if you have something that has like toxicity to the cells, you want something with a tighter control. But um, yeah, so these PG, PX ones have this TAC um, promoter, um, which I'll talk about more in a minute. Um, for baculovirus expression here, you have like polyhedron or P10. Um, you have other things for yeast. Um, and so when it comes to this T7, this is often done in this inducible fashion so that you can induce the expression of T7. So what do I mean? Well, first of all, what is T7? T7 is this bacteriophage or phage. It's this virus that infects bacteria. And uh, more on this in another post, but it's actually really cool in that it uses its own T7, it uses its own RNA polymerase. So the RNA polymerase, remember, is the thing that's going to make the mRNA copy from the DNA that the ribosomes can then make a protein from. T7 uses a different promoter than E. coli RNA um, polymerase. So the promoter is the part where the, where the RNA polymerase is going to latch on and start making the DNA. The E. coli RNA polymerase is going to um, depend on a different promoter. And so the T7, it's only going to work on genes that have the T7 promoter. So if we put the T7 promoter in front of a gene that we want made, then we can get that gene made on demand. Um, by Or if we put the T7 promoter in front of our gene, we can get our gene made. And if we put the it so that we are also in controlling the expression of T7, then we can control the expression of our protein. And this allows us to do this like inducible protein overexpression. So often when we have that T7 promoter, we also have, um, we have the T7 actually provided on in from the bacteria's own DNA. There's integrated with this thing called like a DE3. When you see it, the words like DE3 inside of, a, of the cell name, uh, this is going to refer to this lambda DE3. Um, this lambda DE3 is going to be this like oxygen. It has the instructions for making T7, and it has the T7 under the control of this LAC, um, the LAC promoter. And so typically, the LAC, there's this protein called the LAC repressor that's going to sit on there and prevent the RNA polymerase from binding um, and making this um, and making making the this LAC um, Z gene. So this is what actually happens in inside of bacteria, like why they have this gene. But in the case of our systems, what we have is that we have this LAC promoter in front of the gene for making T7 polymerase. So bacteria use this so that they can control when they make the proteins that are needed to break down lactose. They don't want to make these proteins if they're not going to need them. And they're only going to need them if they don't have much glucose and if they have a lot of lactose. So when you have a lot of lactose, you get this um, trans glycosylation. So there's this little like change in the molecule that is going to give you this molecule called allolactose. Allolactose can bind to that LAC repressor and call, cause it to fall, fall off. This D represses things and then allows for the LAC Z protein to get made, which can be used to um, in part of the process of metabolizing and breaking down this lactose that's in the environment um, to use it for energy. We can use a molecule called IPDG to mimic this D repression, or we can use things like autoinducible media. If we get the media to run out of glucose and give it lactose, then we can get this to happen. And so what, when we stick this in front of, the, when we stick this promoter in front of the D7 polymerase, Gene, now we can then induce the expression of T7 polymerase by adding IPTG or depleting the glucose and adding lactose and giving the protein to be the T7 to be expressed. Once the T7 is expressed, then if our gene is under the control of the T7 promoter, then our protein can get made. There often um, this promoter, this T7 promoter is also 
under the control of the LAC operon, in addition to the T7 being under the control of the LAC operon. So this is going to be in the bacteria. This is not in your plasmid, but your plasmid is going to have the, um, your T7 promoter, and it often has a T7, um, it also has a LAC repressor as well, a LAC promoter as well, so that you don't have unintended, you have a stricter barrier to actually making the protein. And this can be important to prevent like leaky protein expression. So we only want our protein to get made when we add IPDG to induce it. However, sometimes this lac repressor can be kind of leaky. And so if that lac repressor falls off, say, or something like that, a little bit of this T7 can get made. And then if a little bit of the T7 can get made and we don't have a lac repressor here, now a little bit of our protein can get made. If we do have a lac repressor here, however, now both of those kind of have to fall off. And, when, um, and so then it's harder to get your protein made and this is going to give you a tighter control over expression. This can be important if your gene, say, has... Um, is toxic to the cells, you want to make sure that you're not making even low levels of it to begin with. If you're really worried about this expression, you can use cells like these P lysed cells um, that have this thing called T7 lysozyme. And this is going to inhibit the low levels. Uh, it's going to inhibit that T7 polymerase. And so if you have low levels of the T7 polymerase getting through, this is going to prevent those from causing um, your protein to actually get expressed. And so this is good for toxic proteins. Um, and there's like P lyse S and P lyse E. The P lyse S is going to have um, less lower expression of this lysozyme than the P lyse E. You can also see if you look at the various um, strains that the, these expression strains that there are different things that these have. Um, and you'll see like genotype for some of these things, they'll have like a delta sign or a minus sign that's indicating that something's missing, um, as well as various things like that. And often you can just like Google and see what these things actually do um, and various things like that. Um, and you also see these will have different antibiotic resistance, which is the next thing I want to talk about. So this is gonna be your selection marker. So this is how you know if cells actually the, like only, you only let cells that actually have your plasmid survive. So typically what you do is you have on your, on your plasmid, in addition to your gene, you have an antibiotic resistance gene. Then you grow the cells in the presence of the antibiotic and only cells that have taken in the plasmid will have the antibiotic resistance um, superpower giver. And so they'll be able to survive, whereas the cells that didn't take in the plasmid won't. Often these antibiotic resistance genes are things for um, antibiotic resistance against like ampicillin, tetracycline, or canamycin. Um, so if you see like blah, BLA, um, that's going to be your ampicillin. Um, I don't remember exactly all of the names for the other ones right at this moment, um, but you can see that canamycin, the ampicillin, um, you might see spectinomycin, which can often be swapped out for um, streptomycin. Um, and you might see streptomycin, uh, you might see chloramphenicol, various things, um, various antibiotic resistance things. And it's sometimes you want, if you're using multiple plasmids, then you'll want to have different selection markers on each of them. So you make sure that they're all, you can grow them in the presence of both of them. And then only the ones that will have, um, that have both will, plasmids will be able to survive. So you can see that some of the differences with different pet vectors are in their antibiotic. Um, and so some of them are under AMP and some of them are under CAN. So the ones that I use the most are these 28, pet 28, which are under this CAN. Um, so canamycin, you grow them with canamycin. Okay, they might sometimes still have secretion signals. So if they get secreted out of the cell, maybe they'll have signaling. Um, peptides that'll get them into like the nucleus or mitochondria or um, something like that. But if it's like a, um, if it's a, for a non-bacterial expression system. So sometimes they might have like secretion signals um, to make your protein secreted. Then they'll often have epitope tags. So an epitope 
is this word that we use for a feature that an antibody recognizes. And so if we stick one of these little bit extra, an antibody is just this little protein that's going to recognize parts of something else. And that parts of something else is often a protein. And often it recognizes a little part of a protein. Um, and we call these little parts epitopes. And so if we add a little extra onto the end of our protein, then we can get this like epitope tag. Um, these include like HA, FLAC, MIC, V5, or HIS. And so that brings me to my other point is that the tags can often be, also be um, for purification. So sometimes you might see a HIS tag, you might see a strep tag. Sometimes they're also like a fusion partner so that it'll have like a, um, it'll have a, um, like an MBP or GST on it um, to help with solubility as well as potentially with the um, with the purification. So when you have a tag that can act as this like affinity tag, now you can have it do things like protein chromatography where you get that protein to bind to little beads that have a complementary feature to the tag. Um, and then you wash everything else off and then you can um, elute or like push off your protein of interest with the absence of all that other stuff. You can also use these tags for detection with things like Western blots um, or see what it's bound to with co-IPs. You can do things like if you're looking in cells, you can have fluorescent markers, various things like this that you might see with these epitope tags. Often these tags will be next to like a protease cleavage site. Um, so this can be like TEV, HRV3C, thrombin, et cetera. Um, and so you can see that some of the different pet vectors have different tags. And then you'll also see that some of them will be on like the N terminal and some of them will be on the C terminal. Um, and so some of them, sometimes you'll see vectors that have um, on both. And so when you see like C or N, that's referring to the N terminus. So the, like the starting end of the protein or the C terminus, so the ending end of the protein. Um, and know that if you get a plasmid that has a tag in one place, you can always just move the tag with like, um, use like PCR to move the tag to the other end or that sort of thing. So even if the plasmid um, has it on one end, that doesn't mean that you have to keep it there. So this is, again, with the PCR methods, um, like slick and things, it's a lot easier to change things around than it was if you had to rely solely on um, the restriction sites, which I'll get into in a minute. But first of all, um, note that the, when we're talking about the protease sites, these are how we're going to cut off the protein or cut off that tag from the protein if we want to. We don't always want, need to or want or need to. So this is going to be cutting the protein, but then there are also restriction enzyme cut sites, and this is for cutting the DNA, and this is often for cutting the DNA so that you can then move it into some other place, so in this like restriction cutting method. So restriction enzymes are these enzymes that can, so these like protein reactant, mediator, speeder upper things, um, basically they're like, these, these ones are like protein. DNA scissors. And so they will cut the DNA when they recognize a specific sequence. And then if you're in your cloning methods, you can then use that to paste it into a different place that has a complementary sequence. So if you say get a plasmid that has these sites on either end, and then you have a vector that has the same sites, then you can cut them both and mix and match. You can also, if your vector doesn't have those sites, you can add them on with PCR and then do this. Um, but, or you can just use PCR based methods from the beginning. But um, these sites, so you might think, okay, well, how likely is it that they're going to have the same site? But actually these plasmids are often designed with these multiple um, cloning sites or MCS. And so this is going to have a lot of different sequence, um, a lot of different restriction sites for that, so that you have lots of options. Okay, so let's just look at an example. So this um, AGO2 was this protein I studied in my PhD. And you can see that if you look at the vector, so this is the vector, and you can see that it has like all of these different cloning sites, this like MCS, these are all different restriction enzyme cut sites that you can use. 
And so when you have all of these different options, now this is going to make it easier to clone in what you want. So here's just like a pet vector manual. And I think a key thing is that differences between some of the different pet vectors, like the A, B, C, V, et cetera, this is going to correspond to differences in the open reading frame um, with respect to a restriction cut site. And with these different vectors, you're going to have, um, if you, so if you were to use BMH1, you don't have to use BMH1, maybe you use one that's down here more, and then you'll have more letters in front, but you might have different letters in front if you use one of these different things. But if you were to use this BMH1 site, now what you would see is that here you would be, if you cut here, you're gonna be in like a different reading frame than if you cut here, um, because the ribosome is going to be reading these three letter words. And so it's reading on three, 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 three. And if you change um, where the three, where the codon starts, then you're going to have different. So you just need to keep this in mind. So when you're looking at your plasmid and what frame it would be in when you cut it, um, then you would want to make sure that you're in the frame that's compatible with the plasmid that you want to put in so that you're getting the T7 and, um, so that you're getting the ribosome to make the protein um, in a way that makes sense and not a way that's just gibberish. Um, and so again, this is less of an issue if you're using a, a PCR-based method like SLIC. Um, some other thing is that, so another thing to keep in mind is that some bacterial plasmids are actually, you can use this thing called blue-white screening. So selection was when we were just, um, we were saying, okay, only cells that have the, have the, this feature can grow. And so with screening, we're saying, okay, well, anything can grow. We're not anything. It still has to have the antibiotic because you're, you're seeing this in combination with selection typically. But then you want to say, okay, well, show me the ones that have this thing. And so often the thing that we want to see is, okay, well, is our, vec is our insert in the vector? And so is our, is our instructions, is the gene, is the cDNA actually in the vector like we think it is after we cloned? Um, and so the real way we're going to test this is with sequencing. But first, if we want kind of a quicker idea, we can do things like blue-white screening. Um, and this is also going to use um, lackey things, but it's going to do a different way. And basically, I have more on this in another post. But if your, plas if your insert gets in, then it's going to disrupt this gene that's needed to make um, this product that is going to make a clear or a white product turn blue. And so if you interrupt this, if you successfully get your thing into that, into that gene, the, into that plasmid, then you're going to have white colonies instead of blue colonies. And so, but in order to do this, you have to have a vector that's compatible with this. So your vector has to have that gene that you're going to interrupt. Um, and so some of the plasmids that are compatible with this include um, like PGMT, PC18, PC19, and PBlueScript. Um, and then, but the host cells have to be compatible too because they have to make the rest of the protein that's needed. So the part that you're disrupting is really just this alpha peptide, which is just a small part that's going to um, complement the protein that the bacteria strain makes in order to make the full pro um, this full protein that can then make the blue, pro make the, um, blue product. Um, and so the host cells need to be compatible too. And so some of the R are XL1 blue, DH5 alpha, DH10B, JB, JM109, STBL4, JM110, and top this is back to the idea that the cells matter and not just the plasmid. So for example, when we have um, cell, when we're doing our cloning for the, for a protein that we want to express with T7 promoter, initially we stick it into cells that don't even make the T7. So when we're doing the cloning step, um, we often put these in like DH5 alpha. And then here we might stick it in like a BL21 DE3. So that has a DE3 that has the instructions for making T7. Um, but this way we're not making it until we don't want, until we want it. So it's the plasmid and the host cell that matters. Um, just a couple final notes um, before we look again at some examples. So the plasmas also often have a bunch of notation with things like delta something. So the delta means that it's missing. Um, this also can be um, indicated with like a minus sign. Um, so for example, REC-A, these cells are deficient in an E. coli repair system. Um, 
And so the system, this rec-based system, is going to carry out this thing called homologous recombination, where basically the bacteria finds DNA sequences that look the same and puts them together. And so this can kind of shuffle things around if it's, um, and so it's kind of like this repair mechanism. So if, if the bacteria, like if something happens to the DNA and it gets separated, then they can like find the things that are the same and, and use one as a copy for the other, but this can like lead to things getting shuffled around. And so if you don't want this, um, then rec A minus cells, but then there are also things that you wouldn't want this for. Um, an N A mutation is another common one you might see. This makes the cells endonuclease one deficient. So they don't make this um, non-specific endonuclease. So like it nucleic acid cutter. So before we talked about restriction enzymes, and those were really specific. These uh, is not specific, and so it can chew up your plasmid. Um, so NA a mutation will keep your plasmid from getting degraded. Um, so those are some common things that you might see. Um, an interesting note um, is that when I was looking and seeing, okay, well, is a pet vector, are these really like the optimal thing? So apparently these um, were established in like 1987 and then um, Novagen and Invitrogen and then like expanded the series. Um, and these are really commonly used, but um, this group wanted to know, uh, Patrick Schilling and all, they wanted to know whether this was like actually optimal and whether you could optimize it. Um, and so apparently they could optimize it. Um, and so in this vector, you can see that you have this lock operator and this T7 promoter, so it's under the control. You have your gene will be here and it's under the control of this T7 promoter. And then the lack operator is going to repress it um, in addition to having it repressed or having it not be able to mate if you don't have the T7. Then it has a his tag, a thrombin site, so you can cut off that his tag. Um, and then the multiple cloning site where you can then um, cut and paste your gene in. It also has an origin of replication. So this is that PBR322 we we're talking about. Um, it has a canamycin resistance gene and this protein for making the lac repressor. So the thing is that the T7 promoter, one of the key things that they realized was that this T7 promoter that's in here, it actually is shorter than the consensus one. So it's shorter than the one that is like usually used in nature. And so they found that if they restored it to its full length, they got better expression of their reporter, which in this case is this super folder GFP. Um, they also wanted to see if they could improve the the translation. So that would improve the transcription um, by having a better T7 promoter, but then the ribosome also has to ha um, do a good job at really um, getting it, getting hooked on and making the, and making the protein. And so they took this region called this translation initiation region, and they, this is where it's going to help with coupling it to the translation. And they were able, they made a bunch of mutations in it um, and selected for the ones that were best at making their, their protein. And this allowed them to find a sequence that was a lot better than the sequence that was already in there, which um, sequence that was already in there, they say it's likely just because that's what, when they were cloning things together and it wasn't really much thought given to it initially. Um, okay, so yeah, you can actually find this plasmid on adgene. Um, and so you'll see that adgene gives it this like flaming hot signal, um, which means that it's really popular. And so when you get it from adgene, it's often sent, so it's like plasmid sent in bacteria as an agar stab. And so basically they take, you get this little tube and it's got agar, so like um, bacteria food in media um, in like this gel or bacteria food is called media, but it's like in this gel, it's all called agar. And then it has like a little like, um, like little, high pet tip or just a little pool of the bacteria. And then what you do is you're gonna streak this out on a plate typically, um, grow more colonies, maybe make a glycerol stock. Um, so you have a stock for storage, do an overnight growth. So and do a mini prep so you get lots of that plasmid. Um, so when you get something, it'll give you a lot of information about it. It'll give you the information about the antibiotic resistance, growth temperature, um, growth strain, sequencing primers, 
And then when you use it in your paper, then you cite it um, and you give this, um, say like this was a gift from blah, 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 blah. Um, in this case, Daniel Daly. What's interesting is that in, I, I didn't know before, um, until like grad school, well, I guess later in grad school, <laughs> that when people say like this was a gift from, it was often because it was from a depository. I was thinking that like, so they're really just like asking, like each time, like they're just asking this person for their plasmid. But a lot of times it's from actually a gift from a depository. But often you can actually, um, if, if something is not in a depository, um, then you there is the option of contacting the authors to see if they'd be willing to share. Um, but so Adgene and DNASU, these are deposito or repositories that people that um, like authors can donate a bit of their plasmid to. The great thing about plasmids is that bacteria will make oodles and oodles of them. But if each if each um, lab had to keep like giving it out to anybody who wanted it by themselves. That could be a lot of work, especially if you have a really popular plasmid like this. And so what these repositories do is that they um, they like propagate it, they make a lot of it, um, they store it, and then people can go through them if they want to get a sample of it. Um, so either on AdGene or, um, so this is typically where I go first is AdGene. It's just like, because there's often um, a lot, there's often a lot more like the published ones. Um, there's less though, you might have more luck with like a DNA SU if it's something that people haven't studied that much and they have some great tools for helping you find, helping you find them. Um, and so, yeah, um, this is just like a global nonprofit organization, um, works with different institutions as well as has a lot of um, just like sequences that haven't been studied that much. There used to be a plasmid repository at Harvard. There used to also be like this image consortium. Basically there used to be a lot more than there now is. Um, but thankfully you can still get most of what you would want from one of these two places. Um, and then, of course, there are other companies that will um, sell you um, customly cloned ones. Sometimes you might want to use a custom one if you are doing something where you're going to want to optimize the codons um, to make it um, potentially get better expression in a cell type that is not normally made in or that sort of thing. Okay, so I think that was it. Oh, the other thing I want to mention was that when you look up when you go, you can also reach resources from like Uniprod if you're looking at a protein or from GenBank or NS or Blast or something. Um, there'll often be like links to different sources, um, commercial sources where you can get things. If you have, when you search for say the NSU, what you're going to see is so you can see that there are a lot of different ones. And there are a lot of ones even that say that they're in the same plasmid. So you have three of these in the same plasmid. Um, you also see that there's like closed and fusion. So fusion, it doesn't have a stop codon in the way that it's cloned in. So this is just for, these are just for um, like um, cloning and for, not for expression. If you were to try to make it express, there's no stop codon and so it wouldn't work. Um, you'd get some like weird run on protein. But um, when closed, it does have a stock code on. Um, but these, you can see these are different clones for the same protein. Often these have different, um, these will have slightly different um, like sequences or they can have different, um, they can have different, um, Sometimes there are alternative variants to so see like short variant or partial clone um, comparing to other ones. And so you want to make sure that if that you're getting the variant or maybe it's like a splicing variant or various processing variant, maybe there's an alternative start site. Um, so you wanna make sure that you're actually getting the one that you want, but then remember that it's okay if it doesn't come in the vector that you want because you can then sub clone it into the vector that you do want. And hopefully now you know a little more about how you might know what you would want to clone it into. So hope that helped.